Yeah. And uh, maybe at Bacall lunch, I will say a little bit about some of the my earth, earth climate work for a few minutes. But um, uh, I'd say it's, it's a lot less stressful working on other planets because you don't have to live there. And if the senators don't pay any attention to you, which they never, not to me anyway, but uh, it, it's, not so, it's not so critical as long as you've got a laptop and, and, uh, and some way of doing computations. Uh, it's nice to be back here. I, I can't remember the last time I was here, but it was not so terribly long ago, but within the last five years. The last time I was here, I also talked about exoplanets, but I, I talked about two actual planets, or what I thought were actual planets at the time, Gliese 581d. Gliese 581g, and I'm sad to say that neither one of those still uh, is thought to be a planet, but it doesn't, with so many thousands of other new planets, there's bound to be something else uh, equivalent out there. 581g went away very quickly, and 581d took, uh, uh, that was a more subtle uh, analysis problem, and some people think it actually still exists. Today, I'm going to play it safe. I'm, I'm not going to talk about any, uh, in detail, about any actual planets, but a class of atmospheric behaviors that is almost certainly pretty common uh, out there in the universe, uh, 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 planets with uh, what I call condensable rich atmospheres. Uh, and most of the interest here is in exoplanets, but there's some for, uh, for uh, solar system planet history that's relevant as well. And I first want to, uh, uh, um, want to acknowledge two of my collaborators uh, on a lot of this work. Feng Ding, who's a graduate student uh, with me who's done uh, all of the, uh, the numerical simulations and the convection parameterizations for these atmospheres. And my former postdoc, Robin Wordsworth, who's on the faculty at Harvard now, who, who did a lot of work on uh, volatile escape uh, and the role of, non of uh, non-condensable background gases. So, so what do we mean by a condensable rich atmosphere? Well, let's take water vapor on Earth as an example. We can define a uh, mixing, a, a, a concentration, say a specific concentration, grams of, of condensable substance per, per total gram of atmosphere, call it Q. Uh, and the, uh, a, a, the dilute limit is one where everywhere in the atmosphere, uh, Q is much less than one. And as an example, in the present Earth climate, water vapor is a, is a dilute condensable at the hottest part of the tropics water vapor might make up maybe two or three uh, percent of, of the atmosphere. And so it's not a large part of the mass of the atmosphere. When it rains, it doesn't have a big effect on surface pressure. It doesn't carry, uh, ca the, the, uh, uh, the precipitation carries a lot of latent heat because the latent heat coefficient is still high, but the actual, uh, the actual mass involved is rather small. Uh, the uh, kinetic energy of falling precip is a minor, uh, minor factor in the er energy budget. But for the non-dilute limit, okay, and, and most, uh, con essentially all conventional climate models, general circulation models, have thermodynamics and uh, dynamics that is designed to work in the dilute limit. There are a lot of approximations uh, that make life easier in the dilute limit. Uh, now, the non-dilute limit is one where Q is order unity. It doesn't have to be one. That would be a pure condensable atmosphere, like a pure condensable CO2 atmosphere on Mars. But the... Um, uh, but uh, order unity, say you know, 0.1 or 0.2 to uh, all the way up to 1. And so as, a, as an example of, of some non-dilute atmospheres, some atmospheres with a non-dilute condensable, uh, methane on Titan at is, is, uh, is non-dilute. Uh, non at least it would be where the methane is saturated. Uh, in saturation, methane would be about 30%. Uh, of, the, uh, of the atmosphere at near the ground on Titan. Uh, the few observations of the mixing ratio are that it's substantially subsaturated on Titan. I'll be talking quite a lot about subsaturation. Uh, but, uh, but even on Titan, it's maybe 10%. So it starts to edge into the non-dilute limit, even in the op observed concentrations. Uh, if a planet is undergoing a runaway water vapor greenhouse, like we, thought, like we think happened on Venus, that caused the ocean to to essentially evaporate into the atmosphere and be lost to space. Uh, while, it's, uh, while that is underway, uh, the, you, uh, let's say if Venus had an ocean as big as the Earth, or even considerably smaller than the Earth, but let's say if, if Venus had an ocean as big as, as the Earth, you would have something like uh, 200 bars uh, of water vapor in the atmosphere, which would dominate the atmosphere. And if you have some CO2 in there too, maybe it's, maybe it's not entirely pure steam, uh, but uh, but the, the dynamics of the atmosphere, uh, while it is in the process of running away, uh, are, uh, are, are non-dilute. And it's very important to understand those dynamics because some things in that that are going on at that time could perhaps choke off the runaway. Uh, the, uh, 
uh, well, after the runaway is done, and I'll have you a sketch of this, the post-runaway atmosphere has a non-dilute portion near the top, which is condensing. Uh, actually, Mars has a, a portion like that. It's rather limited, right, even today uh, w with its uh, CO2 atmosphere. But this would be generic to post-runaway atmospheres. Uh, if you take uh, any uh, planet with a, with a condensed ocean, for example, a water, liquid water ocean or a liquid CO2 ocean, uh, and you make the planet hot enough by adding another source of opacity like hydrogen uh, or, uh, or carbon dioxide and so, uh, so forth, uh, you, you will eventually make the atmosphere, uh, you will actually eventually make the atmosphere non-dilute. Uh, one of the first examples I got interested in for non-dilute atmospheres is CO2 on early Mars where, where in order to warm up early Mars, uh, 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 part of the story at least is, is that one thinks that it had a, uh, a fairly dense, maybe a two-bar carbon dioxide atmosphere, which later got lost. That doesn't, by any means, solve the whole story of what the early Martian climate is like, but most stories for early Mars start with a dense CO2 atmosphere. Uh, and at the orbit of Mars and with the dimmer sun, you, you, uh, you uh, get large parts of the atmosphere which are, which are condensing CO2 in the non-dilute limit. Uh, also, habitable planets, any habitable planet with CO2 with a CO2 supported greenhouse effect at the outer edge of the habitable zone. That's, that's where CO2 start, the CO2 condensation line starts to approach the surface. Uh, those all have uh, non-dilute uh, non dynamics. Uh, the, uh, uh, though G, uh, the late lamented Gliese 581D doesn't isn't thought to exist anymore, there are simulations of what that planet would have been like uh, that uh, uh, partly but not entirely included some of the non-dilute effects. Those were done by, by Robin Wordsworth when he was still in, in France. Uh, so actually, yeah, I haven't thought about, I guess Pluto would be, Pluto is more or less a pure nitrogen atmosphere. There, uh, it's, it's in yet another dynamical regime because it's, it's more or less uh, an atmosphere expanding from the substellar point into a vacuum. Uh, and so it's not uh, in a hydrostatic situation particularly. And so, although it's, it's non-dilute, it, there are lots of other novel features of that class of atmospheres. In fact, those kinds of atmospheres have a lot in common with rock vapor atmospheres, like on the hot Kepler planets, so, or maybe uh, 55 Cancri. But then um, the, um, uh, there's a lot of interest in possible uh, volatile dominated comp compositions uh, for, um, I mean, not just volatile, but say, uh, high molecular weight H2O or CO2 dominated compositions for, for so-called mini Neptunes, fluid mini, nip, nip, mini Neptunes, low density super Earths like uh, GJ1281b, uh, uh, which is uh, at least one of the hypothesized compositions is that it's almost pure, uh, it's almost pure uh, water substance. Uh, and uh, GJ, uh, sorry, GJ1214b I meant. GJ1214b is in uh, an orbit where its radiating temperature is about 500 Kelvin. It's too hot for water to condense. Uh, but if you took something like 1214b, if it really is a water world, and you move it out to a colder orbit, uh, then, then you would get water condensation. And uh, 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 even without a solid surface, there's something that's analogous to a runaway greenhouse effect in that, in that uh, uh, you, you develop a saturated non-dilute condensing layer up here, whereas I'll show you shortly, uh, the temperature is purely determined by the pressure. And if it's optically thick enough, then the radiation to space is, is determined within this layer, and that's why the dynamics of this layer is so important. Uh, and you can't actually change the amount of cool radiative cooling to space, infrared to space, by changing the temperature down here. Uh, because, uh, because you don't change the temperature here when you change the temperature down here, because this is determined by the clausius clapper on, and, uh, purely here in the non-dilute limit. And so if you have enough sunlight penetrating below this layer, uh, the only way you can actually reach a equilibrium is by, is by uh, building up a hot, dry adiabat down here uh, and then eating into this non-dilute saturated layer until you finally move the radiating level down to hot enough uh, hot enough uh, regions uh, that, uh, that you can actually balance the incoming radiation. So there's a sort of self-limitation in these sort of situations in, uh, in, how, uh, uh, in how thick these uh, non-dilute layers can be if, if the condensable gas is a good greenhouse gas. 
But nonetheless, this is the region that determines the energy balance. So, so this is the region whose dynamics you need to understand if you want to understand the energy balance of the planet. And, and um, uh, this is not something that you can adequately understand uh, just in terms of one-dimensional radiative convective models. And the reason is that the dynamics affect both clouds, which are the saturated end uh, of the thermodynamics where, where you're getting close to con condensation. Clouds are made in nearly saturated air. But also they affect the subsaturation. The dynamics is what generates relative humidities less than one. Uh, subsaturation and subsaturation actually is what saves the earth from being in a runaway greenhouse largely. A combination of subsaturation which uh, makes uh, the water vapor content lower than it would have been and reduces the greenhouse effect on earth plus clouds especially low clouds that reflect solar energy and reduce the amount of absorbed solar energy. Uh, uh, you could easily make a story where the earth should have turned into Venus if you did a saturated cloud free uh, um, radiative convective model of Earth. Uh, and so, uh, and so uh, uh, if you need to actually do understand these dynamical effects on clouds and subsaturation to explain why the Earth is habitable, uh, then that, that applies to, that's going to apply to other planets with other uh, condensable substances or, or just plain old water as well. So, the, so these effects uh, affect the energy balance via the, the albedo and also the greenhouse effect of clouds and the outgoing infrared via the greenhouse effect of clouds and the subsaturation. And so as I said, this applies both to the, this, this actually applies very strongly at the boundaries of the habitable zone at the inner edge where you're getting too hot and water vapor runaway uh, dom, uh, determines whether, whether you remain liquid water habitable or not. But as I point, remarked in, in chapter four of my climate book, uh, the condition that determines the outer edge of the habitable zone for a CO2 supported habitability uh, is, is a, a mathematically identical to the water vapor runaway, but with different radiative and, and thermodynamic coefficients. Uh, and uh, basically, if, uh, if your atmosphere is not in a CO2 runaway, when you try to warm it up by stuffing in more and more CO2, the CO2 condenses out onto the ground in a glacier or ocean, and, and so you, there's a, a maximum greenhouse effect. And that can be understood using exactly the same formalism uh, uh, the same mathematics as you under, as have been long un used to understand the water vapor runaway, and it can also um, uh, this this uh, as I sketched out in the previous slide, this can also affect the dynamics of the outer part of an atmosphere uh, of an exoplanet, and it's that outer part that uh, that determines uh, what we see when we look at transit depth spectra or when we look at emission spectra uh, from uh, from the solar system, and it's an interesting question whether what we see is probing down into the condensation layer and seeing clouds there, or in a uh, radiative layer that's non-convective and non-condensing further up. And that depends on composition. So this is just a part of, of the whole story of, of knowing what kind of object we're looking at. But it's a, it's a part that, uh, that other people uh, don't, that, that there hasn't been a lot of attention to. And I become kind of obsessed with it. I'm not even sure it's the most important part, but the fluid dynamics is really, really fascinating. And the idea of actually having dynamical feedbacks where, where you, uh, where, where you, you uh, have uh, things like, like hurricanes, but uh, they're happening because you lose 10% of the mass of your atmosphere in a storm locally, and then you create this sort of vacuum and stuff rushes in. It's just the, and thinking about how, what this does to the angular momentum budget and potential vorticity budget, it's just the, the, a great fluid dynamical problem. And, and I think it will actually turn out to be useful for something. So, so then to, um, to uh, uh, go back, go to basics and, uh, and, uh, uh, and walk you through the, the most fundamental thing that governs most of the dynamics I'll eventually talk about, uh, let's, let's think about uh, the simplest case where we have just one substance in an atmosphere Think of it as water if you want, but this applies to any, any, any condensable substance uh, just with different temperatures. You have a condensed phase, which could be a glacier or an ocean down here, and it's in equilibrium with a vapor phase. This is not isothermal up here, it's compressible, and we'll say that there's enough heating of the surface or internal energy flux to drive convection so that, uh, so that you have uh, things become well mixed here. Okay, if it weren't condensable, you would get just a dry adiabat up here, just a constant slope in Z, or just the constant potential temperature, constant entropy. But if, you, if it's condensable and it's saturated uh, everywhere, then uh, you get the temperature versus pressure, 
uh, by just solving the clausius clapeyron relationship for temperature versus pressure instead of pressure, vapor pressure versus temperature, because the vapor pressure uh, is the total pressure of the atmosphere in this case. And so you get this rather, these are just thermodynamic constants, C star and P star. Uh, and so you get a, a rather weak logarithmic dependence of temperature on height. So this is the moist adiabat, the meteorology, what we would call the moist adiabat for a single component atmosphere. But the uh, uh, two important things uh, that, first of all, the surface temperature and the surface pressure, meaning the mass of the atmosphere in hydrostatic equilibrium, the surface pressure is determined by the surface temperature. So when you change the surface temperature, you add mass to the bottom of the atmosphere. So that, that changes certain things about the convection compared to the, uh, the uh, uh, conventional dilute case. Uh, the other important thing is that this moist adiabat is, is a no-parameter family. The, if you know the pressure, you know the temperature. These things in here are just thermodynamic constants, which uh, depend on what gas your atmosphere is made of, but you have no degree of freedom, no additional degree of freedom. And, that is the, uh, and this is what I call the steam atmosphere limit, even if we're talking about something like CO2. Uh, it's the opposite end member to the, to the dilute limit. Oh, sorry, yeah. L is the latent heat of uh, either vapor. L is the latent heat of, um, of um, uh, whatever the phase transition is. And so actually, uh, there should be a little kink in here because down here, uh, if this is liquid, L is the latent heat of vaporization. Uh, up here, it would be the la latent heat of fusion uh, where, it's, where, it's cold, where it's cold enough. Uh, so, uh, and then these other things basically come down to... Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, pinning down one point one temperature pressure point on the phase boundary and then cause this clapping gives you the rest. This is the approximation if L is independent of temperature. Uh, you have something similar a temperature of, as a function of pressure. If you have uh, L uh, L uh, being a function of temperature as it always is, it's just you can't write it down analytically. But you you get the same uh, qualitative behavior uh, at least up until you get close to the critical point where L goes to zero. So, so um, something that uh, I'll ask you to try to keep in mind, because this is really the underpinning of most of the interesting uh, differences in non-dilute uh, dynamical behavior, um, is, um, is how the adiabats behave, the moist adiabats behave. So this is constant entropy. So this is what a well-mixed, a well-convectively mixed atmosphere would give you if you weren't fighting too much uh, dynamics or too much, uh, uh, too much radiation, radiative cooling or heating. Um, so this is uh, the pressure in Pascal's 10 to the fifth one bar Earth type pressures. This is with one bar of nitrogen into equivalent mass. I actually keep the, the uh, mass of the nitrogen in this atmosphere fixed as I change the surface temperature. And, th and that's not the same thing as keeping the partial pressure fixed. But the equivalent, it's equivalent mass to one bar of N2, which is a little bit more mass of nitrogen than we have in Earth's atmosphere. And so these are a bunch of, of adiabats with different surface temperatures starting from, say, uh, two, the freezing point 273, and then going on up to 400 Kelvin. And so as I increase the surface temperature, when we're down here in the dilute, uh, where things are pretty dilute, um, the um, uh, changing the surface temperature uh, has an effect on the uh, temperature uh, at, uh, has an effect on the temperature at upper levels. You can see, actually, this is something that's familiar from the Earth. This, the, from the uh, from global warming, that there's vertical amplification of warming. Uh, down here, there's not a lot of water in the atmosphere, but it's when I go, when I start to get uh, into case, into situations where there's a lot of water in the atmosphere, uh, the if I warm up the surface by a certain amount, I warm up the upper part of the atmosphere much more. And between the green curve and this red curve there, where I'm going to 305 Kelvin, uh, you can see that that vertical amplification a great deal, which is just a property of the adiabats. But then you notice when you when I get to very high temperatures where the atmosphere starts to become water dominated, you collapse onto this T of P curve. So this is this is this dashed line here is with a surface temperature of I think 375 Kelvin. This is 400. So so uh, beyond this point, when I uh, when I increase the surface temperature. Uh, I don't change the temperature aloft up in this saturated region. So that if I know the pressure, I know the temperature. So temperature is just purely is, is constant on an isobaric surface. And that will have, have some uh, important dynamical consequences. The, uh, the, uh, w the point at which you reach that strongly, uh, strongly non-dilute behavior uh, depends a lot on, on how much non-condensable background gas you have in the atmosphere. Uh, 
in, the, uh, in this calculation, N2 is non-condensable. And so if you had 10 bars instead, then, uh, then uh, you, you still get uh, dilute type behavior where T is not collapsed onto the universal uh, dew point curve uh, until somewhere uh, past 400 Kelvin surface, uh, surface temperature. And there's nothing magical about one bar. Uh, in a lot of the calculations you see about a hypothetical terrestrial type exoplanet atmospheres, people throw in a bar or so because that's what they're used to. But in fact, there's no, no, there's n we don't even know why there's about one bar of nitrogen on Earth or why there's any nitrogen on Earth. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and why we didn't lose it all during the moon forming collision. Uh, and so, so actually underst uh, uh, understanding uh, nitrogen is, is important, not just from the standpoint of the biology on exoplanets, but on, uh, from the standpoint of the fundamental dynamics and, and water loss. And we'll see by the end that uh, the nitrogen has a big effect on habitability zones through subsaturation. Okay. Uh, Actually, I should have a, is there a clock? Yes, there's a clock here. I should keep an idea. On. What, what time did we start? Yeah. 10.45. 10.45, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so, the, um, uh, so, uh, so, so moist convection is something that always has to be represented uh, by w w what we call parameterizations, which means some kind of phenomenological model in large-scale planetary climate models because we can't resolve these motions out at the, when we're trying to do climate at the global scale. So uh, Fung, my student, has put a lot of work into, uh, into uh, uh, convection representations to embed in global climate models in the non-dilute limit. And uh, I don't have time to go through the details of that, but I want to show you some highlights of the qualitative behavior. Uh, that comes out of that study. And one of the biggest differences between moist convection or condensing convection in the Earth-like dilute case and in these, these uh, non-dilute limits is that uh, you don't really generate buoyancy in, in the sense that we generate know and love uh, on Earth. You don't generate these deep convective plumes. On, on Earth, if you, which is dilute, uh, if you heat the ground, you actually heat and moisten a low layer of the air. So you create air with a lot of potential, uh, a lot of, poten uh, of potential for convection, a lot of CAPE, convective available potential energy at the ground. Because you can have, because the temperature is not just a function of, uh, of pressure, you can actually have a different adiabat that's not connected with the adiabat. It'll often generate a lot of buoyancy relative to what's up here. But what happens instead in a strongly non-dilute atmosphere is that since there's just one universal adiabat, uh, assuming that, that the evaporation is efficient enough to keep the low level air saturated, when you heat the surface, you, you, um, you, the evaporation basically just adds mass to the bottom of the atmosphere. And you don't generate any buoyancy. It's not possible to generate buoyancy. Uh, and so, uh, and so what, meanwhile, while evaporation is adding mass to the bottom of the atmosphere, if it's an optically thick atmosphere, all your infrared cooling is happening up here. That generates cooling, which causes further condensation up here to stay on the adiabat. That mass goes into the surface. And if you're in equilibrium, the, the mass loss from this evaporation equal, is from, sorry, from this condensation equals the mass gain from this evaporation. Uh, and uh, because in energy balance, the infrared cooling balances the input of solar energy, which I'm assuming for simplicity here all reaches the surface. And so, and so, the ma so when, you add, when this rain hits the surface, it just it changes the pressure level back. And in essence, you've moved this little block of formerly liquid ocean uh, up into the lowest layer of the atmosphere. And you do that over and over again, and essentially convection works like a moisture elevator rather than deep, deep plume convection. Uh, and, uh, and, so, uh, and so this has implications for chemical mixing as well. Oh, this is, that's, yeah, you're getting ahead of me. So, so in this, in this, in the pure, in the pure case, yeah, this, that was more or less in my last slide, uh, so unexplored territory. The, um, uh, the, uh, uh, in this case, if I have just a single component atmosphere, it's all CO2 or all water. But uh, in one of the most interesting cases, which hopefully I'll get to at the very end, uh, we're, we're evaporating CO2 into a hydrogen atmosphere. And you have a huge gradient molecular weight. And so the compositional effects give you negative buoyancy, which you're very, very hard to break through. And so uh, we're, uh, we're just edging into trying to do some simulations, resolve convection simulations uh, of that case to see how the convection works there. Um, 
just to uh, uh, put in, in equations just how this affects what you put into your climate models. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, let's look at the mass conservation equation. And uh, all the cases I'm going to talk about are hydrostatic. And the hydrostatic case, if you, if you write uh, things in terms of the pressure as the vertical coordinate and use the hydrostatic approximation and use vertical velocity and pressure coordinates, we call omega, uh, instead of w and z and z, um, then the, in, uh, it, the, uh, uh, the time dependence drops out of the uh, mass conservation equation and just becomes divergence. It would nor normally it comes non-divergent flow and pressure coordinates, but the different term is that you have mass loss by precipitation, uh, and so the, there's a mass sink. Uh, it's not non-divergent anymore, which also affects the dynamics through, through uh, basically uh, uh, um, causing convergence, which changes the, vorticity, the relative vorticity. But, uh, but one important thing is if you have no horizontal divergence uh, in, in the uh, non-dilute case, you can still have a net vertical velocity of the gas phase. And so if you X out the, this and you write the precipitation for that uh, single component atmosphere and just balance the condensation rate needed against the rate at which you move mass uh, uh, up into the adiabat, you, you get the simple exponential equation for the, uh, 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 for the vertical variation of the omega, the pressure velocity, which b has the effect that, uh, uh, let's say, and this thing always gives you, uh, uh, gives you an exponential decay with, with altitude, so the pressure is going towards zero aloft. And so actually, even if omega is non-zero at the ground, meaning you're feeding mass up into the atmosphere for one reason or another, you don't actually need compensating subsidence somewhere else to balance that. It's balanced by the precipitation itself. And so, so the, the mass continuity itself is, is degenerate in that sense. You, it will support any solution with any amount of precipitation and vertical flux. You have to close the problem through other, through other means. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, graphs, this, this, has, this has implications for the, uh, the equivalent of the Hadley overturning circulation as you go deeper and deeper into the non-dilute limit. In an Earth-like case where, where in order to cause rainfall in the upward branch of the circulation in the tropics near the equator, uh, you have to, to carry the moisture upwards and condense it. You, you have to carry non-condensable air with it. So that has to go down someplace. And so in Earth-like uh, circulations, and this happens at all scales from the, uh, the whole tropics down to individual cloud towers, uh, the, the upward mass flux in the precipitating convecting plumes has to be balanced by downward uh, dry air flux in the non-condensing air flux in the, uh, in the surroundings. And this, the compressional heating is where the latent heat released here is actually realized, and that's where the, 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 the infrared radiation balances the latent heat released. But it's, it's, it's different in the uh, steam limit. Uh, the, the return flow of the Hadley circulation, as it were, is the precipitation itself. And so the whole atmosphere can just be uniformly going up and raining out. It doesn't have to be, though, because there are alternate circulations, and we'll look for this when we see the actual uh, simulations, um, uh, the, uh, this kind of thing going on. The, um, if you start convection in just an individual, uh, uh, individual upward branch here, so, uh, so that you have a, uh, omega negative, which means upward motion towards omega equals zero, which is the top of the atmosphere, you have compensating mass flux. Then if you embed that in a surrounding that's not convecting, then uh, omega less than zero means the surface pressure is going down just because you're losing mass from the atmosphere. So you suck in air from the surroundings. And this is also a degenerate uh, situation unless you close it by some other requirement, evaporation, radiation, and so forth, where essentially uh, there's no intrinsic scale that comes out of this argument. You can actually suck the whole atmosphere into a single cloud and eventually rain it out in that one cloud. The, the dynamic does not pick out that solution. And uh, we're still struggling to actually figure out why the, the dynamics in the full model picks out the solution it does. So now let's get into the dynamics. This is the uh, stuff that Fung wrote. So we actually start with s something that's home brewed as far as Princeton goes. We're using the GFDL Princeton uh, FMS uh, dynamical core in the finite volume version. That's basically a conservative grid point version, uh, which behaved better in these exotic regimes than the spectral method. You sim we simplify a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we yanked out the, uh, all the old radiation and thermodynamics, and we put in our own moist thermodynamics that's appropriate to the uh, the, uh, to the uh, non-dilute limit. 
Um, and uh, right now, although we have the capability of putting in an extremely expensive uh, real gas radiation code, uh, since we want to put the focus on the dynamics at the moment, uh, we have a gray gas radiation code with fixed infrared. Op well, actually, I said fixed infrared. Uh, actually, these particular simulations are done with fixed infrared opacity. We also can put in an, uh, a water vapor feedback that makes the infrared opacity uh, a function of the, uh, of the condensable substance uh, inventory. But to keep the focus simple and on the dynamics, here in these simulations I'm going to show you, we have just a fixed infrared optical depth of the atmosphere. And uh, again, um, to focus on the end member limit of a terrestrial type planet where most of the solar radiation reaches the ground and is communicated to the rest of the atmosphere upwards by convection, uh, we made the atmosphere transparent to the stellar radiation and absorb it all at the ground. And right now we're working on the other limit where none of the solar radiation reaches the ground uh, and all the heating is deposited within the atmosphere as it would be for a fluid planet. We have to be careful. It, one tends to think that in cases where you deposit the stellar radiation in the atmosphere or not much reaches the deep part, you wouldn't have convection. But you just have to think about the example of Venus, where, where uh, there, with 90 bars of CO2, the combination of Rayleigh scattering and near IRR absorption means that only a tiny trickle uh, of uh, energy actually reaches the surface of Venus. Nonetheless, Venus has a deep convective atmosphere. It's nearly on the CO2 dry adiabat all the way up. Uh, the, it's, it's a little hard to tell just exact, it, it's exactly where it's radiative and where it's convective. It's got lots of adiabatic layers. So there's lots of convection on Venus. But that's because with, with 90 bars of CO2, it's so incredibly optically thick. Uh, it, the radiation just can't move even a small amount of energy out very easily. So it has to convect get the energy out. Uh, and so, um, and so the, uh, uh, whether or not you actually get a convective uh, layer uh, in this situation where, where the uh, solar radiation is being deposited directly in the atmosphere uh, depends uh, quite sensitively on the profile of deposition, which depends on your shortwave opacity, which is uh, problematic in many cases, certainly if we're thinking about, about exoplanets. But I'm going to talk, talk about the symbol case where, where definitely you're driving convection from below in a terrestrial type, type way. Uh, and uh, uh, although we have simulations with tide-locked uh, configurations and uh, all sorts of low order spin states, uh, just to highlight on some of the energy transporting uh, effects of these uh, in these non-dilute atmospheres, we're going to take a rapidly rotating case, an Earth-like rotation in, in, a, in a habitable zone orbit that with Earth-like opacity in the atmosphere uh, gives you a uh, gives you surface temperature of around 300 Kelvin. Um, we have a steady annual average uh, installation, which depends on latitude only. We have no continents. We have a swamp bottom boundary condition. And so this is a fast rotator case. And then actually, instead of varying the uh, stellar constant uh, or the orbit to control the diluteness by the temperature, uh, we, we're uh, controlling the diluteness by changing the nitrogen partial pressure. So if we take away all the nitrogen, the atmosphere is always non-dilute. If we put a whole lot of nitrogen in at, at a given temperature, it can be very made, made very dilute. Actually, changing, putting the nitrogen in, even though we're not putting in any Rayleigh scattering from the nitrogen, uh, that does slightly change the surface temperature uh, because it changes the heat transporting properties and so forth. But it's not a very big effect. So, uh, so uh, the, all the simulations uh, from Fung's work uh, that I'm going to show you uh, can be thought of as having more or less the same peak tropical temperatures. So, so um, this is uh, this is this slide actually gives you the, indicates the basic behavior. And now, so um, uh, here we're varying the uh, the uh, 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 effective partial pressure of nitrogen from uh, from uh, seven and a half bars to. Uh, uh, to um, uh, 2,500 pascals, uh, and uh, so this is more than Earth, uh, and uh, this is a little bit less. This is actually similar to Earth, but also I've marked on these graphs the maximum uh, water vapor concentration at the hottest part. And so this is Earth-like; it's 3% water vapor concentration, and this is 80% water vapor concentration down here. Uh, and uh, this is latitude height. Uh, this is the equator there. There's the North Pole, the South Pole. It's symmetric because of everything in the forcing is symmetric. Uh, but this is a full 3D general circulation model. Uh, and, um, and so you, you can see that 
uh, even though we're fixing the Earth's, uh, fixing the rotation rate. So we're not changing the Coriolis force. Uh, uh, but as we make the atmosphere more and more, uh, more and more um, non-dilute, you make the temperature more and more uniform, both in the horizontal and the vertical. Okay, what's going on in the vertical, since actually more and more of this atmosphere is getting convective, what's going on in the vertical is it's just you're converging towards this logarithmic adiabat, which has very weak vertical gradients. That's the standard sort of thing. The horizontal thing is more, a bit more of a surprise. In some sense, you can think of this as being due to the extremely effective heat transport due to the amount of latent heat available in the atmosphere. Uh, but, it, but the simplest thing is to just remember what I showed in one of the first two graphs, that as you, uh, as you go to the, if you, if you keep the atmosphere saturated, that's the big if here, if you keep the atmosphere saturated, then you converge onto an adiabat where the temperature is just a function of pressure. And since th these are, this is pressure coordinates here, basically uh, you're just seeing the temperature converge onto this universal adiabat, T is a function of P. Or in, er er we, in Earth meteorology, we call that a barotropic atmosphere where temperature doesn't vary on pressure. Uh, what is the delta between red and blue here? So, uh, oh yeah, so actually the, I, I deliberately didn't mark it because I didn't want to, uh, but the, um, uh, uh, because it was the patterns I was focusing on, but this is 300, and this is about uh, about uh, 180 there, um, and so um, and so uh, uh, it's expected that when you have a planet with very weak rotation, just because uh, there's no Coriolis force to balance pressure gradients, you relax to a fairly uniform temperature uh, distribution. That's called the uh, Earth tropical meteorology. That's called the weak temperature gradient approximation. Uh, that's expected, but here we're on a we're in a case which has Earth-like temperature gradients. Uh, the uh, in fact fairly realistic Earth-like temperature gradients uh, when you're in the dilute limit, uh, but uh, but then becomes more and more like a one-dimensional uh, radiative convective model in essence. And, so, and that part is good news because it means that actually to some extent we can use radiative convective models to uh, to uh, to uh, understand some aspects of these atmospheres, but. Not to understand, uh, we, there's still dynamics, there's still motion in there, and I'll show you. And there's still a lot of meteorology going on, but, but uh, in terms of understanding what's going on, uh, it's going on in a background of nearly uniform, horizontally uniform temperature, which makes things, uh, makes, makes things simpler. And I'll show you some animate, break and show some animations in a bit. But I said that this, this collapse onto the uh, temperature, uh, on, onto the barotropic case uh, requires. Uh, uh, that the atmosphere be pretty saturated, and the behavior of the saturation is extremely important for the energy balance uh, of atmospheres. Uh, and so, um, but uh, uh, although uh, there's some, I have some plausibility arguments for why the atmosphere tends to become more and more saturated as you go to the, go to the uh, to the non -dilute, strongly non-dilute limit. Uh, I don't have a complete theory of this yet, and that's one of the things we're working on. But if we define a saturation ratio, which is the ratio of the actual partial pressure of your condensable uh, to the saturation uh, part vapor pressure. We would call that relative humidity uh, on Earth uh, in meteorology, but this could be any substance. So in the, in the dilute case, again, just from the properties of the idea, but in the dilute case, even if you fix the temperature, you can vary the subsaturation from zero to, zero to one. So temperature gradients and moisture gradients are independent in the dilute limit. Uh, but in the non-dilute case, uh, the uh, temperature and the uh, subsaturation are linked. In fact, if you go all the way to the steam-dominated limit, you can't change this. You can't make it subsaturated without heating it up. So that means that uh, that if you try try to create dry air. If by uh, lifting up some air here and pushing air, some air down there, you create strong temperature gradients which tend to mix, mix away. That doesn't say that it, it uh, settles down in a, in a saturated state. It just said, says it settles down in a fairly uniform state of subsaturation. Uh, but uh, uh, in any event, in order, to, uh, in, in order to create subsaturation as you go into the non-dilute limit, uh, you have to have strong heating by one means or another, either by stellar absorption or by strong subsidence. Here we don't have any stellar absorption in the atmosphere, so that's out. Uh, that will be explored later. But we also don't have strong subsidence because the, if the atmosphere settles into a barotropic state, all the motions are horizontal and there's n no downward motion to create subsaturation. Diagnostically, that's basically what's going on. 
uh, but what we really haven't answered is, 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 uh, is, is just why it always gets attracted into this barotropic state, because you could cobble together states that were strongly baroclinic with strong subsidence and strong subsaturation, but uh, they, they, they don't maintain themselves. They always fall back into this barotropic state. And just this is the, just what comes out of the model. Uh, this is the uh, subsaturation from uh, the relative humidity. And this is the dilute case with 3% maximum concentration. Uh, and the color bar there goes from 0% to 100%. This is an Earth-like. And this is the middle of the atmosphere, um, uh, more or less, uh, in both cases, and the, um, by mass. And uh, you get uh, these very dry zones, just like you do uh, in the Earth's tropics, what I call radiator fins in my 1990 paper, where, where a lot of the uh, energy from the tropics comes out, and that's where you're saved from the run runaway greenhouse by the, by the ability to radiate through these very dry zones. Uh, uh, here you, you do get, uh, you definitely have something like a Hadley circulation even at 80% uh, uh, maximum uh, specific humidity with, with an intertropical convergence zone uh, here and fairly moist air, and then subsidence here. But notice the color bar. This is all much in a m much more limited range of humidities, much weaker subsidence, much weaker contrast. This co this color bar goes from 90% in the blue region to 100% in the red uh, in the red region. Uh, and so uh, so there's really very little subsaturation generated. So uh, it really is. Uh, behaving, uh, it's behaving like a, well, it's, it's, it's staying quite close to saturation. So again, it behaves like a saturated radiative convective model so far as the, uh, uh, so far as the radiation balance goes. Now again, to keep things simple, this simulation has no clouds in it. And so we can actually infer, we could infer uh, the effect of this on the subsaturation on water vapor uh, feedback uh, if we wanted to. But if you put in clouds, uh, uh, the fact that you're close to saturation everywhere uh, means that this small sluggish vertical motion you get uh, is very good at making clouds, or would be very good at making clouds. Uh, and so uh, at some point we'll start toying around with some idealized cloud models, but you would definitely get uh, cloudy regions here and here, and, dry and uh, clear sky regions here just like you do on the Earth. Uh, but uh, small perturbations could give you more clouds in this situation. Sorry, what? Oh, oh, this is zero obliquity. Yeah. Oh, sorry. How? How? Oh, uh, the, this uh, it, with non-zero obliquity, then this this uh, the, the basically you would have a seasonal cycle. We haven't actually done non-zero obliquity in this case, but the. But this, this um, uh, um, upward band, the intertropical convergence zone, would move left and right uh, the, um, uh, in the course of the seasonal cycle. And would tend to, uh, brought, because as the substellar point just moves into the northern and the southern hemisphere. And, uh, and then the, uh, the polar regions become, would, become would become somewhat convective and cloudy in that case, that, that which is more or less what Titan actually does. Although, uh, uh, the, the, how much uh, seasonal cycle you get depends on whether you actually it depends on whether you make it non-dilute by by heating it up and putting a lot of more lot more water mass into the atmosphere versus reducing the N2 because in the in the um, seasonal cycle simulations we did with the 1D model uh, if you have a lot of if you uh, if you have a hot case with a whole lot of latent heat in the atmosphere the uh, the seasonal cycle is almost completely damped out. And it doesn't even notice the seasonal cycle of insulation because it takes so little temperature change to change the heat content of the atmosphere. There's a huge thermal inertia just from the latent heat uh, in the atmosphere. But you only get that effect if you, if you make it non-dilute by uh, heating it up so there's a lot of latent heat in the atmosphere, not by this other uh, regime where we are non-dilute by virtue of taking out the N2. Oh, uh, that's that's numerical error in our polar filtering. We haven't gotten that glitch out. Although it it, it looks worse than it is because, it, I mean, it's it's pretty bad. But the uh, uh, the the uh, actual humidity contrast there is uh, uh, the actual humidity contrast there is is fairly fairly small. Uh, you wouldn't see it on this on this scale particularly. But but this the this um, this uh, this the grid is still a lat long grid, uh, even though it's finite volume and it and there's problems with polar filtering which affect our moisture advection.
uh, it's uh, in, uh, I'd like to figure out how to get rid of that, and we're still working on that. Let me just show you. Let me just show you uh, uh, some animations to indicate what sort of thing is going on. So here is the. Uh, 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 well actually, I'll just I'm running low on time, so let me just show you the the humidity pattern. This is this is in the dilute case. It's Earth-like. This is the relative humidity pattern. This is going from eight percent to ninety-six percent. This is the vertical velocity. Uh, blue is upward, so that's rising motion, uh, and the red is 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 downward or subsidence. You see that you have subsidence probably by most of the area, but you you set, have, see this westward drift, which is actually quite similar to something called the Madden-Julian oscillation on Earth to this nicely defined, uh, this nicely defined uh, uh, zone of, of uh, saturation and then these radiator fins, these subsaturated uh, zones. This is at 500 uh, millibars, about halfway through the mass of the atmosphere in this case. But you also see these baroclinic eddies here, this uh, hammerhead sort of shape where, uh, where you have uh, transport of, uh, of heat and moisture uh, through uh, tapping into the potential energy of that temperature gradient there. And if you look at the, uh, uh, at the relative humidity, and again, the scale is compressed in the, uh, the non-dilute case. Uh, then um, for you, you actually see a much more sort of random spotty convection. This is, this is 90% and then this is uh, I think 60% there. You see these little subsiding zones here where you get the uh, in local patches you do get subsidence with with uh, with the relative humidity as low as 60%. But if you look at the pro probability distribution the histogram of relative humidity there's a very tiny tail of unsaturated air and it's it's really spiked the air is really spiky at uh, about 95% relative humidity there. Uh, but again, you, you don't you 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 uh, you see convection popping up and then being sheared out by weak bar. It turns out to be weak barotropic jets in this region. But none of that uh, uh, none of that bar that characteristic uh, baroclinic uh, eddy pattern. But there's meteorology going on there. There's meteorology going on there. This is a slice at uh, this is a slice at uh, halfway through the mass of the atmosphere. Uh, and so since there's less mass of the atmosphere because we reduced the N2, we, it's, a, it's a lower slice. But, so, but it's roughly midway through the, through the, uh, through the mass. It is midway through the mass. That's right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um. Oh, th this is a fairly low resolution sim simulation. This is a, it's about two degree. It's about two degree resolution, so. Um. And uh, at some point, we'll push it up to higher resolution. OK, so uh, running, OK. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, not running too far behind on this. So oh. OK. So uh, uh, now I've said that modulo this, this incomplete understanding of the subset of what keeps it saturated, um, uh, the, uh, you expect the temperature to become a function of pressure alone, to become uniform on isobars uh, aloft. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a surface temperature. Uh, oh, well, I just go through this. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't have a, a, surface, uh, a surface temperature gradient. But first, just to uh, dot the I's and cross the T's about the barotropic nature. Uh, as the, uh, this is the thermal wind relation, which comes from putting together geostrophic balance and hydrostatics. Uh, which says that the vertical shear of the wind is equal to is equal to the uh, is proportional to the horizontal gradient of temperature at constant pressure. So as you go to this steam dominated limit, where the temperature is just a function of pressure, there's no vertical shear in the wind, and it's purely barotropic. So we do expect uh, sat these saturated, non dilute atmospheres to become to have barotropic dynamics, but you can still have a surface pressure gradient because the surface is not an isobar. So you can have a surface pressure and temperature gradient. And so if this is a uh, pressure coordinate here, your surface is actually tilted. So if you have a differentially heated planet, it can still be hot at the equator and cold at the pole. Uh, but, uh, but we find that the surface temperatures tend to relax towards pretty uniform too. And there are for, uh, we track that down to the one dominant mechanism for planets with a solid frictional surface. Uh, that could also be magneto resistance on some kinds of fluid planets. But or Im implied magneto resistance, but but the uh, the dominant thing is actually good old Ekman pumping, which will be familiar to the 
I, there's, I think there's one oceanographer in the audience at least, but the, the uh, uh, well actually some meteorologists too because we, this, this Ekman uh, spin down is important uh, in the atmosphere. But so if you have a, ge if you have a barotropic wind and, you, and uh, at the ground, uh, and so you have a pressure gradient from pole to equator, and you have a geostrophically balanced barotropic wind, which, ha which, uh, which hits the surface where it's frictional, then the frictional balance gives you a drift, an Ekman frictionally balanced drift, balance between the Coriolis force and friction, uh, which is strong where the winds are strong and weak where the winds are weak. But that, causes con that causes divergence here and convergence there, which then uh, sucks vo down vorticity and, uh, and, and, and destroys it by stretching and compression. And, this, and that causes a damping time, that, that causes a damping effect that eventually relaxes the barotropic winds to zero and destroys the vorticity up here. Uh, and the, the time scale for that is the scale height divided by the boundary layer thickness times the frictional damping time in the boundary layer. And it's not directly dependent on omega, although omega in some cases, the, the rotation rate of the planet can affect the boundary layer thickness, but lots of other things can affect the boundary layer thickness as well. Now, I don't have time to go into uh, the mathematics uh, of where how you turn this into a climate model, but it turns out in, in the paper that we'll eventually be publishing in Croc Roy Sock, the, uh, the, the heat transport in this system can be represented exactly by a diffusion equation. Uh, so it's like, it looks, it wind, this system winds up looking a lot like these toy uh, diffusive uh, energy balance models, except you can justify that model of the heat transport for Ekman damping uh, without any approximations and even get the diffusivity. Okay, so now I, uh, we're on the most fun stuff. I'm part of a small group that is thinking about life in non-water oceans. And um, one, in one of the cases we're thinking about is uh, CO2 and supercritical CO2. And so uh, uh, it, you know, it's, we don't know much about uh, about uh, biochemistry outside of water, there are a lot of uh, missing uh, bits of our understanding, or you know, not bits, but huge missing pieces of the understanding of, of life and especially the uh, emergence of life in water. But, uh, but um, there, there's at least, at least some grounds for speculation about what kind of biochemistry you might have in solvents other than water. Uh, and most of these would be solvents that are a lot col colder than water when they're lick, uh, uh, than in the typical climate situations I'll, I'll, I'll sketch out. Um, and one of the cases is a CO2 ocean. Uh, a planet is too cold to have liquid water surface ocean, might nonetheless have a CO2 ocean which is liquid at, at the lower temperatures than, than water, water would be as a lower freezing point. And, that might, and even if there's no life there, that might have some observable consequences in terms of the thermal inertia, the seasonal cycle of planets, maybe even sun glint off the ocean and so forth. And so, um, um, and so to uh, give you an idea of, of uh, where thi various things happen for carbon dioxide, uh, you have the uh, triple point down here uh, where gas and solid and Mars is more or less down in this regime uh, where you don't ever, uh, it has too, current Mars has too low surface pressure to ever give you liquid CO2 even at, uh, and you don't have uh, deep CO2 glaciers that could cause liquef liquefaction at their base um, either. Uh, but um, as you go above, I think it's 217 Kelvin, it's on the next slide, then, then you, you do have, uh, have liquid, and it's liquid up to quite high pressures, up to 1,000 bars before you go back into a, uh, a high pressure solid phase. And then the uh, critical point where you lose the phase transition uh, is at about 300 Kelvin at, and just shy of 100 bars. And so that means that your general picture of, of, of um, what uh, a, uh, planet uh, with, with pure CO2 uh, in its surface and atmosphere would look like at various temperatures. When you're down below 216 Kelvin, uh, then, then a saturated, uh, a saturated uh, planet uh, would have uh, uh, CO2 ice near the surface. It would actually have liquid CO2 down below, below the ice. Um, actually, that's kind of problematic because CO2 ice uh, sinks in in liquid CO2, but it, you would actually liquefy the CO2 below an ice layer on a planet like that. I'm not sure exactly what is going to happen, and there would be some kind of interesting breaking up of this ice and melting and refreezing at the surface. So it's not really going to be a solid ice crust. But the um, but anyway, but you, your your dominant surface would be icy by thermodynamics uh, with certain surface pressures determined by by Clausius Clapeyron. When you're between the critical point. Uh, and uh, 216 Kelvin, 
then you have uh, you might have a high pressure ice phase if the ocean is deep enough. You have liquid, uh, and then you uh, uh, and then you have the gas up here. But as you approach the critical point, the uh, the density discontinuity at the ocean surface disappears. That happens with water in the course of a runaway greenhouse. If you have a deep enough ocean, the ocean does not actually gradually, uh, if you have an ocean with more than about 200 bars equivalent pressure, uh, the ocean does not actually gradually all evaporate into the atmosphere. It warms up, uh, and as it warms up towards the critical point, the ocean surface loses its distinct identity, and so things like convection in the ocean no longer stop at the ocean surface. Those plumes make waves which penetrate deeper and deeper into the atmosphere. And so when you pass the critical point, suddenly your ocean is the atmosphere. Uh, and, uh, and that would happen with CO2. Uh, that would happen with CO2 as well. It, it's a curious thing that Venus, uh, that Venus has, um, uh, that, uh, uh, well, we don't know how much ocean Venus actually, actually had, but, uh, um, so we don't have, you know, we have no, uh, the Earth's ocean though is about the equivalent of 200 bars. So it would go into this case where you just barely lost all of the ocean at the point where where uh, where uh, uh, you had uh, uh, reached the critical point. So anyway, uh, so that's that's the situation. But you have to, besides the thermodynamics, you have to look at the energy balance and say this is this is actually uh, a version of the figure from Chapter Four of my book. And so. Uh, this is for a saturated atmosphere with just CO2 in it. And this is with the real gas radiative calculation. This is the outgoing infrared radiation, the cooling to space as a function of surface temperature. And so uh, this flat part is your runaway greenhouse effect. If your absorbed solar radiation if you're, uh, or is, is above this flat part, then there's no equilibrium until you have, uh, uh, until past the point where you've evaporated, you've put all of your uh, condensed reservoir into the atmosphere. Into the atmosphere. And that depends on the surface, uh, on the surface gravity uh, through the hydrostatic relationship. But the thing here is if you look at, if we take, say, this case with, uh, or even this case for a super Earth type surface gravity, there's essentially no window between where you, where you liquefy the ice. There's no window of orbit. This is basically the proxy for how, how far your orbit is. There's no window of ra absorbed radiation between where you liquefy the ocean and where you run away and it all goes into the atmosphere. And uh, this actually is true for water on Earth too. But if you put nitrogen in, you put in an, a tra an infrared transparent background gas, that actually does, does two things. First of all, it, 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 um, uh, through changing the vertical structure, through changing the adiabat, uh, it, uh, uh, it, actually, uh, uh, it actually has the potential to, uh, to, uh, to move the flat part of the curve off to the right. For nitrogen, it actually doesn't do that. If, you have, if the CO2 is still saturated in the nitrogen, it doesn't actually increase your window very much, just a little bit. This is the saturated CO2 in a nitrogen background. So this is liquid out here. But if you then, but the other thing is, remember, when you start to make it dilute, the, uh, the, uh, which is possible, uh, then, then you can also have subsaturation. So this is with subsaturated CO2. And so, you, and so now you can see that you have a, uh, a considerably bigger window, or at least some window for where you can have a CO2 ocean. Uh, and uh, finally, if you do something like put hydrogen in, uh, hydrogen background, uh, that adds some opacity to the background atmosphere and warms it up. And then you get into, the, into some of these cases, uh, again, like this green case, uh, where, uh, where you have a very big window uh, where, where it's warm enough to have a liquid CO2 ocean. And so uh, actually, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, if you did a pure water vapor calculation for Earth, you would find there's a fairly narrow window where a planet can have a water ocean proportionate to the mean solar radiation involved. And so the combination of opacity from CO2 plus some, uh, some feedbacks from reflectivity in the atmosphere, albedo feedbacks, plus the, the subsaturation and background gas is what, what gives you a moderately big range in which you can have a, a liquid water ocean. But it, it, it really depends on a lot of dynamically determined things like subsaturation. So, and that's basic. That's, I think I won't walk through these conclusions except to uh, go right to the, you know, this, what I just barely touched on at the end is that actually, um, without, uh, actually, uh, liquid oceans uh, do require a, a, a fairly finely tuned uh, orbit to exist. And, uh, the, when you see these fairly broad habitable zones for the CO2-dominated greenhouse effect, 
uh, to give you a liquid water ocean. That's because there is a regulating mechanism that works over millions of years that controls the CO2 opacity to put it in a region where you have a liquid ocean. Uh, if you actually did not have that feedback that controls the opacity and keeps you in a liquid water range, it's very, very hard to tune an orbit so that you have a liquid water ocean, even harder for a G star or an F star to tune it in such a way that it will stay liquid uh, over, the, over a couple billion years of the life, life of the star. So, uh, uh, but I, I think actually uh, uh, there are some unexplored albedo feedbacks uh, that uh, re relating to clouds that can also, uh, clouds that also just uh, sh um, near IR absorption in atmospheres that can also help stabilize the range of, or for a liquid water ocean. But uh, generally speaking, uh, all of this requires an understanding of the, of the whole range of dynamics ranging from dilute into the non-dilute case. And, uh, and so, uh, so we have a lot of work cut out for us. Thanks.